Over these past weeks in Acts, we've, we've seen the continued ministry, the continued mission of Jesus, haven't we? We've seen the, the church of Christ grow uh, despite the, the opposition that has come upon them, the opposition of many kinds. And in the very last verse of chapter 5, we read that in every day in the temple and in house to house, uh, the people were preaching Christ, were preaching that Jesus was the Christ That salvation could only be found in in his name. It can only be found in Jesus. And what we began to see and what we've seen over these weeks is as the word went out, the Lord added more and more to their number. And then it's here in this passage that we have this morning and that we begin to see some of the growing pains, not the necessarily the, the, the opposition, but the growing pains of a church that is rapidly growing. But we also get to see some more of Satan's attempts uh, to distract the church, to ensnare the church, to seek to destroy the early church. Satan has been evidently involved in these past number of oppositions that have been coming against this early church, seeking to silence the name of Jesus. He's, He's happy. He's happy for people to believe in a God, in a creator of some sort, but not so much that people hear about Jesus. Not so much that people hear that Jesus is the only name by which they can be saved. And so unjust imprisonment, beatings of many kinds, unfair unfair hearings, torture, charges that are brought to uh, to make silent the apostles, they were all an attempt to, to quash the early church, to to silence them so as they would speak not of Jesus. Then we saw Satan seeking to destroy the church through falsehood from within the church, through the hypocrisy of those who professed but did not practice, the stubbornness of those who sinned but did not repent. The Lord acted to protect the church from such sin, such sin that Satan was using to divide the church. And fear came upon the church, didn't it? As we saw the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And as people watched from afar, whether they were inside the church or outside the church, great fear came upon them. And so what have we been learning over these few weeks? What is it that stops the gospel? Nothing. No opposition. No, n- nothing can stop the gospel. But what threatens it? What, what makes it harder? It's a church that does nothing. A church that does nothing, a church that does not obey God, but rather falls in line with the wisdom of the world or falls in line with man. So the church in Jerusalem, it continues to grow in number as the gospel goes out, as Christ is proclaimed in obedience to Christ. And there's three things that we're going to be considering from this short passage this morning, from these seven verses, that gospel growth always brings blessing. It always brings challenges, and it always brings opportunities. So let's have a look. Gospel growth brings blessings. We see that in verses 1 and verses 7. This whole section is bookended with these blessings. As the gospel goes out each and every day in the temple and from house to house, the disciples, verse 1, were increasing in number. And then verse 7, the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples, the number of followers of Jesus, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And get this, a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Here we realize, if we haven't already, that the passionate proclamation of the gospel, with an everyday focus on Christ Jesus, of, of every believer, not just the 12 apostles, but every believer, not just church leaders, not just GC leaders, not just ministry leaders, but every disciple of Christ declaring and displaying the gospel of Jesus Christ. It leads to blessing. It, it leads to blessing. It leads to the church growing, more and more people coming to saving faith in Christ. There is no other blessing that can be experienced no other blessing that we could hope for as a church, that more and more people coming to know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. That's the power of the gospel. Whenever even priests, the priests who were those who were the so-called critics of Jesus, 
the so-called critics of the gospel going out, even they came to know Jesus as their Lord. Even they came to be obedient to him. If that's what causes the church to grow, the gospel going out and people becoming part of it because they accept the amazing grace of the Lord, then we should be a people that rejoice. We should be a people that praise God for the fruit of the harvest. And so we should, we should celebrate gospel growth, gospel-centered growth. It's, it's not about building a crowd to say, look at us, look at how big we are or who we are, but about a church being built by people embracing the truth of the gospel. And time and time again in Acts, we, we are reminded, aren't we, that it is the Lord that adds to their number. It is the Lord that adds to their number as the words of life are proclaimed, as the words of life are preached, and as the words of life are heard. In Matthew 13, uh, Jesus shares a parable um, to, to kind of speak of the kingdom of heaven. It says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and it gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, the, the men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers and threw away the bad. So it will be, he says, at the close of the age, the angels will come out and will separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And just as it will be at the end of the age, so too have we seen it within the early church. And within the church as we know it in the 21st century, the gospel going out is, is like that net being cast into the sea. It, it gathers many, it brings many, many kinds of fish. And some are good and some are bad. Some of it's debris. We, we see that in, as we look to fishing trawlers, what they collect, all of the, the, the plethora of rubbish that we find in the oceans these days. What, this is, what Jesus is saying through this parable is, is growth is, is not always pure. Gathering a huge net is not always full of good things. You can get all sorts in the net. We've seen it in Acts. There are true converts, and then there's pretenders like Ananias and Sapphira. And we will see the same with, with others as we walk through Acts. And what the Lord is saying is ultimately he will sort out the true from the false in his timing. But it means that the church will face challenges. It means that the church will, whenever it is, it is rapidly growing, just as the church in Jerusalem was, there, there will be challenges that they will face, such as sin and that being worked out, such as failings. But there will also be much blessing. There will also be much blessing. At the beginning of Acts, we had these 12 apostles with a community of 120, a normal-sized church. At this stage in Acts, it's believed there was somewhere between 10 and 20,000 believers in the church. Can, can you imagine that? Just a matter of a few short weeks. Luke has been counting all the way through uh, the people because he wants us to remember that the people counted, not as a means of look at us, but because they truly counted. People matter to the church. But even more so, they matter to the Lord. Just think of the parable of the lost sheep. The 99 safe sheep are left so as Jesus could go for the one that was lost. People matter to Jesus. So people matter to the church. But it's in the midst of this gospel growth when hundreds and thousands of people are coming to the Lord. They're joining the church it's in the midst of that that we begin to find the drama unfold. When we begin to realize that there are challenges that are being faced. Look at verses 1 to 3 again. The apostles, they received a complaint. Now this word, complaint, it's, it's the same word that was used in the Exodus. Uh, whenever the Israelites were, were grumbling, whenever they were murmuring against Moses and ultimately against God. Uh, the apostles in this instance were the ones who received the relief money. If we remember back to chapter 4, whenever everyone sold their, their possessions and they brought it before the feet of the apostles so this, the apostles could distribute it to all who had need. And they were expected to distribute that in an equitable way, in a fair way. And so the grumbling that was received, the, the complaint that was received is 
wasn't directed to the apostles. It was directed against the Hebrews. And it's not appropriate, we see throughout Scripture, for, for God's people to be grumbling, ultimately against God and His fairness. But the complaint was nonetheless brought ultimately to the apostles. The church wasn't only dealing with opposition from Jewish authorities. It wasn't only dealing with spiritual pretenders used as instruments of Satan to shake the church into disarray. It was also dealing with distraction. Distraction from the priorities, and, uh, but also the failings brought about by the church's rapid growth, rapid increase, and human limitations. The Hellenists, they arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected. They were being neglected in the daily distribution. These Hellenists, where they were Grecian Jews, they were people who had come to Christ in this instance. And they were Greek-speaking. They were, they were Greek-influenced. They were devout in their faith, but they were highly influenced by Jewish culture by Jewish philosophy, by Jewish, sorry, Greek philosophy and Greek living. They behaved like Greeks. And during the Persian and the Hellenistic periods, the 500 years before Jesus, these, these Jews had, had gone out into all of the different regions of the Mediterranean. We saw where they had come from whenever we looked at Acts 2, verses 9 and 10. All of those people groups from all around the Mediterranean basin and then they had migrated back to Jerusalem. And for some of them, uh, they had lost their husbands. They had lost their families. They were widows. And they had spent all that they had to survive. But now they were really struggling. The Hebrews in this passage are, are those purists, those Aramaic, those Hebraic Jews. They were the ones who were deeply immersed in Hebrew culture. The, the, the true believers, they would, believe, they would say. And there'd always been this rivalry between the two. We need to know that. There'd been a rivalry between the two. The Hellenists were seen as second-rate Jews. And they were outsiders. They were treated differently. But the tragedy that we see here is that there seems to be the prejudice of, of the past has worked its way into the early church. Uh, despite that being exactly what Christ had died for, that there neither be Jew nor Greek. There'd be no separation. That we would be one in Christ. And so the challenges that these apostles, these 12 apostles are facing is that they were responsible for giving out what had been given by the people to all those who had need. They were responsible for that. But as the church grew, this was becoming an insurmountable task for them. And you can imagine in the, in the early days of the, the early church, uh, James and John, they go to the marketplace and they, they, they buy some extra fish and some extra bread for Phoebe, who's a widow. And they bring it around to Phoebe's house. Uh, and then Andrew, he goes out and he goes down to the shore and he picks up some, some, uh, some extra uh, meat uh, for Sarah and her kids, who lost her husband that previous year, who were struggling to make ends meet. Whenever there was a small church, the the apostles knew who was in need. No person was with need. That's what we've been reading as we've walked through Acts so far. But this church has turned into a mega church in just a matter of weeks. Now 20,000 members in a very short time, many of whom had great needs, many of whom were missing out. And we see it's the Hellenists, the Hellenist widows, that were being missed. Now, it doesn't tell us. It could have been because of a prejudice against the Hellenists, something sinful. Could have been that. But the response from the apostles seems to suggest that it's a failure, not because of sin, but because of the challenge of, of human limitations. Did they not care for widows? Of course they did. Of course they did. They did all that they were able to do, but there was only 12 of them. I don't know about you, but as I read that, I find that an encouragement. I find that helpful to know that this early church was struggling in this way. Often we, we create this, this almost, this image of the early church is this perfect church. This church that we want to emulate in every way. 
Is it a good model? Yes, of course it is. Is it a perfect church? No. No, it's not. Do they have lots of wins along the way? Yes, we've read of them, haven't we? Even in the midst of opposition. But do they have many failures? Yes, they do. And what we find in this short passage shows us how the apostles sought to deal with the challenges how they sought to deal with the failures that they were facing because it highlighted more than just the widows being missed. Firstly, it's evident that there was an us and them mentality growing within the church, whether it came from the history of people, but there was an issue of disunity arising. One side was complaining about the other. One side was complaining of injustice against them. But what we also see is sinful responses It was right for them to be concerned about the Hellenist widows being neglected, but it was wrong to complain against the Hebrews as if they had been causing it. There will be times that we have an issue, a justified issue, a concern, and we should bring it to the leaders, in this instance, to the apostles, and let them be able to work out those issues together. There will be times when people in the church will be justifiably concerned, justifiably offended by something. And there will be times when we just don't respond rightly to those concerns. And what we learn from Acts is that we have to seek to maintain and to protect the unity of the church, which means taking your justified concerns, your right concerns to the people who need to hear it, to leaders or the right person in charge of that. Too often we find ourselves in a circle of complaining and grumbling about something or someone, rather than speaking directly to the person who needs to hear it, who can make the change. Why do we do that? Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's trying to rally support. Sometimes it's, it's not having a solution, so I don't know what to do, and I'm kind of trying to f- come up with a solution. It's a mixture of, of good, legitimate reasons, but also potentially sinful reasons. And so before complaining about something to someone, ask this question, is this the right person that I need to speak to? Or will this just stir up division and disunity within their hearts and within my hearts? Am I coming to, to share something constructively or am I just grumbling? Am I just complaining? We want to ensure as a church that each of you has, has the ability to come and to share concerns, to ask questions, to give humble, constructive feedback about things because we don't profess to be perfect. We don't profess to be perfect. We just, as the apostles did, will get things wrong in the church. But we want all of these things to be shaped by love and grace towards one another. There'll be things that we're doing in the, this season and the seasons ahead that we will get wrong. And we need humble, constructive help and wisdom to guide. We need love and we need grace for one another to walk through those things. The second issue that the apostles were, fallen, were, were facing is that these challenges that had arisen in Acts 6, they don't seem to be because of sin, as we've said. They seem to be legitimate issues, but it appears that the challenge has been caused by this rapidly growing church in a very short period of time, and then the small amount of leaders. Verse 2, the apostles, they gather the full church together. It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, something to note here, they're not diminishing the role of this ministry. They're not saying that serving tables is beneath us. What they're saying is we we can't do it all. We can't do it all. We don't have the the time or the the availability. We are limited by our capacity and and our humanity. We, We can't give up preaching, for that is what we've been called to do. But we know that this work needs to get done, and we know it is important Dare I say it, even if they had the best Excel spreadsheet, even if they had the best planning um, center, uh, which is what we use, um, systems in place, detailing all of the needs 
detailing all the widows, their addresses, and what they needed, they still would have failed. And because they were only human, and they were small in number. This whole passage is, is reminiscent of Moses in Exodus 18. And the people are coming to Moses. They're asking him to judge over all things. And then his father-in-law, he steps in. Uh, he watches. He watches what Moses does. Uh, and then he gives some sound advice on sharing the leadership burden. He says, what you're doing is not good. What you're doing is not good. You and the people, you will certainly wear yourselves out. For the thing is too heavy for you. You're not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and you will make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Sounds a lot like preaching. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy, who hate a bribe and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties and of tens and let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you and you will be able to endure and all this people also will go to their place in peace. And Moses listened to the advice of his father-in-law and it was good advice. It proved successful. And you see the apostles living out this, this almost the same advice. They took this approach in verse 3. Therefore, brothers, they come to the, the full church, the full congregation. Pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Gospel growth brings about opportunities. The apostles knew that they needed to prioritize the, the right things because they could so easily be distracted. They could so easily be distracted from what God had called them to do. They're not saying that those things aren't important. Quite the contrary. They realized the significance of those ministries, the significance of those needs, and they accepted they can't do it all. Serving tables is not something less Christ has called all of his followers to be servants, just as that word for serving tables suggests. We all serve in ministry, whatever that ministry may be. But what we find here is that the gospel growth brings opportunities to the church. In the church, we we have all sorts of ministries, don't we? All sorts of ministries, formal ministries, Uh, with a title, and informal ministries, just coming alongside one another, where we get to serve one another. In Cornerstone, we've we've got our kids' ministry. They're serving so well out the back, teaching our children, our many children, about the Lord Jesus, about his kingdom. Uh, We've got hospitality ministry, welcoming people into the church, prayer ministry, pastoral caring and counseling ministries, discipleship, music, and tech ministries, building maintenance, cleaning ministries, admin ministries. There are countless ways to serve in the life of the church. And friends, they are all ministries. They're all God's people serving one another for his glory and for his renown in different ways. And you see it as you look around. There are plenty of needs within the church. Without all of these ministries and all of these people serving together, we would not function properly. We would not function properly. The Lord has gifted the the members of this body, the members of his body, the church, uh, to be able to serve one another, to build up the body in love. We are blessed to have people who love spreadsheets. They're few and far between. Uh, but we are blessed to have people who love building and populating columns and rows uh, with with the names of people who who can serve, who have signed up to things, uh, to make sure that we're not asking people to serve on multiple teams on the same week. Uh, If that's ever happened to you, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sure it has. Sometimes spreadsheets don't work. 
Uh, but these, even these past weeks, as we've had to do some changes within things, I, I've been distracted uh, by, by seeking to help navigate and, and understand spreadsheets with people, trying to, to deal with all sorts of other things, important things, really important things across the life of the church. But I've seen it in myself. Uh, it has taken me away from uh, the ability to, to dig into God's Word And I know that I am limited in my humanity. I know I am limited and that I am weak and that I will fail you. And I get a sense of what the apostles are feeling as the people come to them, as they complain and as they grumble. I'm thankful that there's no complaining, there's no grumbling. But I know what they're feeling. They want to be devoted to prayer and to the ministry of the word but it is so easy to become distracted by all of the other important things in the life of the church. We're in a moment as a church, a moment where we are seeking to grow and be strengthened uh, for things have happened. And for our members, we, we recently shared, because of recent circumstances, that we've begun reorganizing some things to enable us to, to grow in those ways, to enable us to serve one another and to do it well. And by putting together some new teams in the life of the church. In the past as a church, whenever we had a need, we would simply do a call out, who can help? We would do it within our GCs and you would get a message. You've all seen those messages on your GC WhatsApp groups. Now we're we're trying to, to get better organized, to get better equipped, so that we can avoid what Jethro warned Moses about. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out. We don't want that. The thing is too heavy for you. You're not able to do it alone. Uh, so now we, we have teams. Uh, and each of those teams who have leaders who, who have been appointed, men and women who love the Lord, who love serving, who love the ministry of serving God's people. And in the same way that the 12 apostles failed at meeting the needs of the people by the limitations of their humanity, so too with the seven The seven men didn't solve all the issues in and of themselves. We we don't read of it, um, but they had people that they would lead. They had people that they would bring in to help the needs being met, share the ministry burden in order to meet the needs of this church. And that's what we hope to do with the the small changes uh, that we have made. But here's the thing. As I said, in the past, we just did a call out. Who can help? Who can help? It was, a, it was ad hoc. It was a, the week before. And it worked you know, because the church was smaller and we could do that. It was easy. But as the church has grown, we've, we've needed to adapt and sometimes we have failed. Sometimes we have fallen short of those ministry areas and the impact has been felt. The impact has been felt. The same people were were serving week after week in different ministries. And they were beginning to find the burden too heavy. And so today, if you're you're a member, we want you to consider where can you help? Where are you able to step in? This this is the call going out. Rather than on the week in a a WhatsApp message, this is the call going out to ensure that we're able to meet the needs on your seats whenever you came in, you, you would have seen this little bit of paper. Maybe you've looked at it. Maybe you've already done everything you need to do with it. But can I encourage you to just have a look at it? It's a piece of paper with all of the, the different ministries of this church on it. And you might be in some of those teams already. There might be some that you're passionate about and that you're not currently on. And we don't know that you're passionate about because we just asked who can help? And we've not had a chance to, for you to, to step in. Or maybe there's areas of need that you see and you, know, you go, I could step into that. I might not be the only solution, but I could step into that. If you're a member and you want to serve in one of those areas, can I encourage you to tick the box? If you already serve in that area, tick the box anyway. And that means we know that you're, you're still in. You're still in. Making this space inviting, making this space welcoming, making this space hospitable for people to come in 
uh, to feel at home, to feel loved, means that we have to ensure it's clean and we have to ensure that it's safe. I don't know if you know this, but over the course of each and every week, we have over 200 young people in this building across this whole site. Uh, and I don't know if you, like, if, if you've got kids, you know what having two, three, one child in the house is like. Imagine 200 plus. And this place gets messy, it gets grimy. It is a real blessing that we get to serve uh, so many kids over the course of the week, whether it's in, a, in, in Pebbles, and the Pebbles team are constantly cleaning uh, to make sure that it's, it's a safe, clean place for the, the kids to come, whether it's some of the other community hires that we have for, for young people, whether it's for complete works that they come. It is a blessing that we get to serve them. But ultimately, it means that this place needs cleaned every single week that we might come, that we might be able to experience a welcoming, hospitable, warm, inviting environment. And so there's much work to be done. There's much work to be done to make this place clean and safe for every Sunday. And so can I encourage you, if that's something that you could step into, there are people who have been a blessing to this church, who have silently every weekend come and, and cleaned this place for us and that we might be able to just rock up on a Sunday and feel warmly welcomed. But more help is needed. If that's something you can help in, they would love that. This morning, a toilet seat had fallen off. I think Anna has maybe fixed it. Amazing. But there's small things where we need to think through, how do we keep this building from falling apart? It's getting older than me. Um, and it, it's falling apart at times. And we need to fix it. And there's been men of this church and women of this church who have been doing that. Uh, but we still need help. Each Sunday, new people and long-term members of this church family, they come and they gather together. And our hospitality team, they, they stand at the door and they welcome people in. They give the welcome that we have received in Christ. They, they welcome at the door. They, they, they bring people to the coffee and tea so that they can enjoy a coffee conversation. They, they guide guests around. They point them in the direction of the toilet so as they know where to go and they're not just standing, kind of hovering around. They help ensure that the people know how to engage and connect with us as a church. They make sure that people are able to feel at home. And no one's left out. This ministry is so important to us as a church. It's so important to welcome people well as Christ has welcomed us. We have received it and so we want to display it to, the, to those who come in through the doors each and every week. Whether they are for, for, here for the first time or whether they're here for a lifetime, we continue to extend that welcome. We have so many people coming each and every week it's important for us to come alongside them. It's important for us to connect with them. It's important for us to engage with them, to enable them to feel at home. And we've changed the structures of how we, how we form those teams. They used, again, to be within the GC environment and so that you would get the call out during the week or the preceding week saying, who wants to be on hospitality? Who wants to be welcoming? But we've, we've everything that's been changing, we've, we've structured the teams, and now we need to know who, who is willing to step in, who is willing to step in, so that no one is left out. Just like the widows in our passage, we don't want anyone to be missed, anyone to be left out. Those are just a few examples that are on that little uh, slip of paper, that form. Can I encourage you to prayerfully consider where can you step in? Where can you serve? as part of the church. Our, our heart, and you need to hear this, is that we don't overburden. But actually it becomes a joy. It becomes a joy to serve. We don't want the same people serving in, in every area. We need to know who is willing. And so if you're a member of the church, can I encourage you to, uh, to fill in a, a couple of boxes? Maybe fill in them all if that's, your, if that's your thing. We won't overburden you. We've got spreadsheets for that. But if you've got a willingness to serve, then that is an opportunity to, to be part of that and to engage with that. And if you're not a member, if you're someone who is, is not a member of Cornerstone, we're all yet, and you just want to know a little bit more, 
We've got a little bit in the, on the form just for you. For you to engage, like whether it's getting to know Cornerstone World, whether it's getting to know who we are, what we're about, hearing about our values, our, our vision as a church, what we're doing as a church, whether you're interested in, in engaging with our, our gospel communities, the community in the life of the church, or, or maybe you're someone who, who's professed faith in Jesus Christ, but you have yet to be baptized and you want to find out more about that, or you maybe, maybe you want to serve. Maybe Cornerstone has been home for you, but you just haven't yet stepped into membership within the church. Here's an opportunity to, to do just that, to tick that box and we will engage with you over the course of the week and help you walk in that and answer the questions that you might have. Hopefully what I've shared with you is, is pleasing to you. Just like in verse five, it's pleasing uh, as the apostles' plan was given to the church, given to the full number of the early church, and what they said pleased the whole gathering. And so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicolaus, and a a proselyte from Antioch. After the service, just drop these pieces of paper. There's a little box or a basket at the back. Just drop it in, fold it up. You don't have to show everyone what you're doing, how much you're doing, how little you're doing. Put it in the box, and we'll get in contact with you. Or take it back home, pray over it, Take your time over it and then just simply drop it in the offering bucket next week or contact me or contact Becca who will be organizing those spreadsheets in due course. In Acts 6, we we read of the congregation of this church picking and choosing seven men and then the apostles pray over these men, men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom. And these seven servants, they helped bring unity to the body. They helped ensure that the legitimate needs of the body were met. And they enabled the apostles to remain focused on, devoted on prayer and the ministry of the word. Through these few verses, with with all of the changes that are happening, with the failings that are evident, we get to witness a spirit of love and grace displayed towards one another in the church. Do you notice there's not a big church fight? There's no breakup between the Hellenists and the Hebrews. Instead, we see God's people being led by God's word and the love of God binding the church together. And we see the blessings that come from it and the opportunities that come from it also. It's another wonderful, practical passage of Scripture that we need to be reminded of time again, where Jesus' Spirit-filled church unite together for the sake of his glory and for the good of his people. Tony Merida, who wrote one of the books that we have at the back, uh, Love Your Church, he writes this, uh, we should probably consider this as the normal church pattern. Preach, pray, Grow, anticipate drama, manage the drama, pray, keep preaching, and then get ready for more drama. And when it hits, keep praying. Keep praying. Times of crisis provide the church unique opportunities. Throughout the history of the church, controversy has served to purify and to strengthen the church. So let's choose to see challenges as opportunities. Every Monday morning, we pray. We pray together. What an opportunity to continue praying together for the sake of the church in light of what we're reading this morning. Once a month, second Monday of the month, we pray together. An opportunity to to grow in our dependence on the Lord. Uh, to seek him and his kingdom and his wisdom and his guidance as a church. I'm encouraged as the church preaches of Christ every day, whether it's in the church or in the house to house, in homes, in workplaces, uh, wherever we find ourselves, the Lord adds more and more to their number. As As the church forms realistic understandings and expectations of one another, 
as they form realistic expectations of, of their leaders. It enables each part of the body, each person of the body to, to take opportunities to serve, to bless one another. The church becomes more organized. And as it does so, the body grows so that it is able to build itself up in love. And we become more grateful to God for one another. We become more grateful to God for the blessing of one another. We become more willing and more joyous as we get to serve alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ. As the church continues in these things, we pray that the local church will be effective in caring for the needs of the people and also faithfully continuing to proclaim the excellencies of Christ, the good news of Christ Jesus. That's what we get to see in Acts 6. The church effectively caring for the people. They missed the mark and then they worked away to ensure that that didn't happen again. And what happens? The word of God increases. The word of God increases and more and more disciples join their number. And priests, people who even opposed Jesus, become obedient to the faith. The Lord builds the church. The Lord builds the church. He is building it and he is purifying it. He is making her beautiful. That's what we get to witness as we walk through Acts together. And we wonderfully get to be part of it. We wonderfully get to be part of it as individual members of the body of Christ. And so let's pray. Let's pray that we might be useful in our service to him as he continues to build his church in this place and to the ends of the earth. Let's pray now. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, for this passage of Scripture, which perhaps at times we would just walk through quickly, thinking it is a piece of practical advice. But Lord God, we thank you that you speak through your word to remind us uh, that you're building your church, that Satan might use different opportunities to try and distract us from the, the, the proclamation, from the declaring of the name of Jesus trying to distract us and inhibit us and make us grow weary so that we wouldn't do it. But Lord, I pray that we will be rooted and grounded so much so in the love of Christ that we will do whatever it takes to continue proclaiming him. And Lord God, I pray that we will not be distracted also from meeting the needs of the people pray that we will not be missing the mark and that we will be able to serve one another. And Lord, we know that there will be areas in the life of the church that we can't even think of right now to put it on a piece of paper. But you help us to see where needs are needed. And Lord, I pray that you give each of us the right heart that we come, instead of grumbling and complaining, we come to highlight a, an issue and to constructively seek to bring about a solution for your glory and for the good of your people. And so, Lord God, I pray that as we consider this passage today, that you would help us to think through how we can serve, how we can be part of the solution of, of meeting the needs of your people. As a congregation, as a full congregation, help us to to see the, the joyful opportunities that you have presented before us. And Lord, I pray that you would give us a willingness to, to lay aside maybe some of the, the things that stop us and to help us step in. Lord God, we pray that we would listen to the advice of, of your word, that we will not overburden one another, but we will actually find it a pure joy and delight uh, to serve one another for your kingdom. We praise you, Lord. Would you continue to transform our thinking, transform our hearts, that we might serve you and your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.